here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is the C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. As you know, we love a special guest. This week, it's going to be the turn of Del Farrington, who was in a band, I think in the 90s, called American TV Cops, but before that, used to put on interesting and funky little indie gigs um, in his hometown, including bands like The Wedding Present, Razor Cuts, Mighty Mighty, The Chesterfields, and much, much more. Anyway, this is the interview. I'm in the UK, he's in Bangkok. The reception's all right, it's a little bit gloopy at times, but you'll get the gist. So, um, after several minutes of interest and but casual chat, we got down to that exciting subject that was his early formative years. I know, it's a classic. Anyway, Dell, take it away. So yeah, I mean, I, I, like I said, growing up, I was, I was never really a fan of, of music in particular. I wouldn't, I wouldn't class myself as a fan. Um, I used to you know, listen to the radio and all the bands like Slade, Sweet, Mud, or, you know, and Mud in particular were, were, were a favourite of mine. I was obsessed with Led, Les Gray for a period. Yes. Um, bought, the, bought the black leather driving gloves that he used to <laughs> and used to pretend I was Les Gray in the playground. But yes. other than We love Tiger know, Feet. Oh, was... yeah. I mean, absolutely. The songs were brilliant, but, I, you know, I, I couldn't really profess to be in a a fan. I didn't used to rush out and buy the records on the day of release. Yes. That what was your game. What was your first single you bought then? Um, it was Devil Gate Drive by Susie Quattro. Right. Uh, so that would have been 74, 73, 74. So it was very much the glam uh, period, wasn't it? Yeah. And it was just, I mean, it was, it was a great song. And I, I think, you know, I just thought, oh, I'm going to buy that. And so that was the first thing that I bought yes. with my own money. Um, but other than that, I wasn't really interested and, until a couple of years later when, like a lot of people my age, I had a, a paper round and I was delivering the papers one day and the, the front pages were covered with the, the Sex Pistols story, the, the aftermath of the Bill Grundy interview. And I remember reading this and just being absolutely fascinated by it and thinking, this is brilliant. You know, a 13-year-old boy, this, this just touched a nerve. Yes. So without even having heard the band or heard anything about punk rock, I thought, I want to be involved in this. So I, I rushed out to buy the, the single, the Anarchy in the UK single, and it more than met my expectations. You know, the, the sound of it was that this is exactly what I wanted it to sound like. So you didn't um, have any older brothers or sisters who gave you any musical influence or any kind no, of... No direction on that front. No. And, no, what, no, and were your parents at all musical? Did they have a, a sort of 50s or 60s period of kind of listening to records from Elvis to the Rolling Stones? Not really. I mean, my mum my mum was a big Johnny Ray fan. Um, she loved Johnny Ray. Uh, but she was mainly into folk music, you know, a lot of sort of... Northern English, Irish folk music that she used Blimey. to listen to. Martin uh, McCarthy. Dean, yeah, um, the old Oldham Tinkers, <laughs> bands like that. Um, and, and so I, that was really that all used to get played in our house was, was folk music, Johnny Ray and Dean Martin. Was the other right. one. And a guy, called, a guy called Lovelace Watkins, who was this American, I think it was American, was he American? Might have been South South. South African, I can't remember. But he, he was this guy, and he was huge in the northern clubs in England. Absolutely fascinating story. Um, and my mum absolutely loved him. And we've I've still got now um, autographed LP covers with Lovelace Love Watkins. Love God, you have to look on yeah. eBay and see if they're worth at least £5. Yeah, yeah. Because that's no quite obscure, isn't it? It yeah. is very obscure. But he, he was huge. He was enormous, like, I, you know, for some reason. But if you, if you do get a chance, look into him. He had quite a fascinating life. Did you ever see that film? Was it about the Sugar Man, this man in, in America who made some records and then, you know, just kind of became, you know, just lived quite really poorly in some basement as a cleaner, but then suddenly found he was huge in South America. No, South Africa. He was like a superstar there. And it was like, you're not going to believe this, but you're you're really huge. <laughs> it's an amazing film. It's one of those kind of award worthy, award winning films. Who searching for Sugar Man? I think if you if you get a chance, it's quite heartwarming and bizarre because it's like, you know, suddenly he's playing in stadiums, and you know, one minute he's in America sweeping the floors in a 
school or some office block and then somewhere else he's he's this kind of god so um it does happen so lovelace is obviously you know he had that story didn't he yeah i mean he, he, he did he did the hard work he you know like i said he, he he played all the northern clubs back in the sort of late 60s early 70s i guess yeah so he, he probably he died of lung i was going to say yeah, he probably, died of probably. lung cancer <laughs> yeah I mean, it wasn't the healthiest of environments, but no, um, it's not. But yeah, he's so yeah, fascinating story. Yeah. So, so yeah, apart from that, there was. I mean, my my auntie, who's quite a bit younger than my mum, so not that old than me. She was she was around during the Beatles, so I can I can remember going round to my grandparents when she was still living there as a teenager, and she had the Beatles wallpaper and you know, all of the, the paraphernalia and she was listening to the records. So that really was the only kind of contemporary stuff that I was exposed to. Yes. Growing up. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was really this, this, you know, the Bill Grundy interview that got me. That was the it. one, that was the one. There yeah. you go. And then what about your gigging period? When did you go to your first gig and um, who did you go and see? Uh, well, the first gig I went to would have been the Clash on the White Riot tour, uh, which was in Leicester. And bizarrely, I, I still know, and if anybody can answer this, I'd, I'd be grateful. Any record, I mean, the, the gig definitely happened. I was there, and I think it was even recorded. So, But it, it never appears on any of the, the tour posters, so it must have been added quite late. I think, right. When I've tried to recently, you know, look back you know the the advertising posters and everything it's it's not actually listed in the orig- original tour date so I'm, I'm not really sure but that was the first one and i was very lucky because you know my parents had, had said to me you know we'll we'll take you to the gigs we'll, we'll we're happy to drive you you've got to pay for your ticket you've got to pay for the petrol money but we'll take you and we'll pick you up and living where we were at the time which is burton on trent which is right in the middle of the country we were we were surrounded by like leicester derby wolverhampton birmingham nottingham sheffield all these places were, were quite easy to get to so you know during that that punk period i'd, I'd go you know we'd go and see bands two or three times on the tour so buzzcocks the clash the jam the damned you know we'd, we'd go off and see them in in these various places and it was my god it was great, they're all the know, classics aren't they god, from that period yeah. crazy crazy you know it's a so sort of 14 15 year old it was it was really exciting you know, yeah great gigs and then as i got a bit older obviously i you know i had friends who could drive and once you kind of get 16 17 18 you're able to make your own way to to band so we were, we were going off to see all sorts of groups you know, in that post-punk thing, you know, the Bunny Men, Teardrop Explodes, um, and then into bands like Orange Juice, Fire Engines. My God, um, all the classics. So look, yeah, you, you had was... the punk, then post-punk, then 83, the Smiths come along. God, I love the Smiths. So five yes, years yeah, of yeah. indie pop, isn't it? And then obviously you had the NME Sounds Melody Maker with huge circulations and um, John Peel's show, which played all that groovy music, as well as people like the pub, you know, Public Enemy and... The Bundu Boys, who we loved so much, and all those kind of early rap rap artists. So, yes. Yeah, so what was your indie pop period like? Well, after, I mean, again, like you, the, the Smiths were, were huge. I mean, they, they changed the landscape, really. I, I think it's, it's quite hard to remember just how... I think things have got a bit stale, haven't they, by, by 83, and then the, the Smiths kind of burst onto the scene with this, this sound that you, you couldn't really... Put your finger on. I think John Peel famously said, "You know, you, you just you listen to the Smiths and you can't tell who they've been listening to." Yes, and I think that he was said. Yes, he said true. that very thing, which is quite interesting, isn't it? Really. So um, yeah. yes, and I, I think you know that that it was it was that that burst of excitement, and obviously, you know, you, you had this lead singer who was right out there flamboyant and he was kind of saying things that you could identify with back then um <laughs> not so much now but um <laughs> and, uh, didn't see that one coming did we? <laughs> um and then this kind of you know it opened the door didn't it? and you you know straight behind that you had bands like the mary chain jesus and mary chain who, who again you know made this wonderful sound that was so exciting and, and the gigs were just chaos and it, it, it just kind of it got you excited again in music. And I think that, you know, the, the seeds of, of C86 
Um, yes, that's, that's I know. Where, that's where they I know were, pe- people know. always gone about C81, which I think is a quite a good cassette, but it's it's kind of a bit random, really. But um, yeah. yeah, it's got yeah. links on. I mean, again, which I thought was quite I mean, again, an interesting of, funk one. Yeah, it was it was a lot more varied. I think that that, that was that's the advantage it it holds over its. Uh, the one that came along five years later. Yes, it did, but, actually. Um, but, you know, so that, so once, you know, 85, 86, early 86, we, we were going, seeing bands, you know, two or three times a week, you know, mainly to Birmingham, quite often to London. We used to travel down to London quite a lot, to the um, Bull and Gate in Kentish Town where John Beast had his, his, his time box nights. Um, we'd go to Subterranea, Bay 63, in Madbrook Grove, that was that was a popular popular place to visit. Um, and uh, was it the Clarendon? Oh yes, but yeah, the Clarendon. We saw a couple of gigs there, I think. Um, and this is when we kind of hit on the idea of, of putting our own nights on, you know, because bands were quite very approachable. You know, we'd we'd got quite friendly with Primal Scream at that time. You know, this is when they were in the jingly jangly birds. Did they have did, did they have the excitable tambourine player at that stage? They did, yes, they did. Um I didn't I didn't I did an um, interview with him actually. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. So I, don't, anyway. I don't know if you've read Bobby Gillespie's book, but I I don't think he, he thinks too highly of him. He <laughs> makes one or two disparaging remarks. Yes. For some reason. I mean it, you know, it was they, they, they were all very nice to us. I mean they were, you know, they were, they were very tolerant. Um, so I think I think the original idea was we'd get Primal Scream to play, but even back then I think you know that you know that they were beyond our means. We couldn't really afford to to put them on. Yes. And some of the bands, Age, Age of Chance, were another one actually who we were very very keen to have on. And they, I mean, they, they were great. I love the Age of Chance, still do. And but again, you know, they, they said we, we'll need this as part of the PA. We'll need this. We'll need that. We'll need the other. And we're thinking, hang on, you'll be lucky to get a couple of couple of speakers and a microphone. Really. <laughs> so <laughs> we thought we've, we'll perhaps leave that one till later. So the, the, once once we'd kind of thought, right, these these are probably a little bit beyond our reach. Um, we'd gone to see Primal Scream at Bay Sixty Three Subterranean, whichever it was at the time. I can't remember. Yes. Um, and the support band were Razor Cuts. So we, we approached Gregory after the gig, who was the lead singer and guitarist, and just said, you know, would you fancy coming to play up in the Midlands? And he was keen, very keen. So we, we swapped phone numbers. Um, I gave him a ring a few days later and we, we fixed a date. Uh, and that was it. It was then just a case of getting everything together, advertising locally, um, and the band had turned up and play, and it was blimey. Really that there you go. You you entered that moment, didn't you, of um, <laughs> yeah. rock and roll stardom? I know it's kind of exciting. I think I did a few little gigs, but nothing on the indie pop front. Well, they were sort of benefits of things like Greenpeace, but it still gives you a buzz, doesn't it, of anticipation oh, and worry absolutely. if anyone's going to turn yeah. up. So, did you manage to break even? Um, I think we we did we did on the first one. Um, I mean, we, we we were putting the gigs on in in Lichfield, which is just on the outskirts of Birmingham. And the the thinking behind that was that because there was a, a local railway connection to Birmingham, we'd get quite a lot of people coming coming out from the city to yes. see these bands. Um, I mean, I don't think it quite worked out like that. We had we did have one or two come, but not the not the sort of legions that we were hoping for. Cues around the block, uh, no. Yeah, so we yeah we put it on. It was a really successful night. The the guy from the local newspaper was very enthusiastic. He was a big supporter of what we were doing, and he you know used to pick us up in the paper and gave us glowing reviews. Um, and then the the so it all went really well. So we thought, yeah, this is this is a good start. Um, you know, did we'll, you think we'll you because I know Norwich had you know, and I'm sure every place did, you know, would have a sort of a I don't know Wednesday or Tuesday night. It was called the Wild Wild Club, and I suppose that was the same. They'd have three bands for like two fifty, and um, yeah, it was kind of almost weekly, and occasionally to have a few breaks in the in the year, you know, probably in the summer. But generally, that was that was it. So, was your thinking was having a regular 
indie club night? The the thinking really was just to try and get bands on as often as we could. I don't, you know, there was no plan to have a, a weekly thing or a monthly one. It was just whenever the bands were available, we'd put them on. Yes. Um, so it was uh, that really was our approach. You know, if we can get a band, just get them on as soon as we can, and try and keep the momentum going as well. Yes. Without actually commit, without actually committing to saying right, this is going to be every week or this is going to be every month or whatever. Uh, and it, it worked really well. I mean, the, the second gig was actually two weeks later and it was the wedding present. And again, a very similar story. We'd, we'd been to see them in, in the, lead, at the lead mill in Sheffield, uh, which was a great venue then and a great venue now. Yes. Um, just get, get a quick, quick plug in. Please save the lead mill. Uh, I know. It's worth saving. It's a fantastic place. Um, and I just approached the, the guitarist, Grappler, after the gig. He was, he was watching a World Cup cup match on the, the telly in the bar. And I just went over and said, look, you were fantastic. Would you like to come and play in, in Staffordshire? And he said, yeah, OK. So again, it was a case of swapping telephone numbers. I rang him up. Um, and two weeks later, they came to play the gig. And What year was it, that again? They... This was 1986. This was right at the height of, this was summer 86. So you can imagine, you know, that this was right in the middle of the C86. Um, yes. Had George Best come out yeah. then? No, that was 86. No, yeah, yeah, this, this 86. was prior. Uh, Once More was the single. So that they put the first record out, Go Out and Get Em Boy. And I think Once More had just come out because we used the, we used the front cover of that on the posters. Um, yeah, and... I remember getting the twelve inch. That was um, once more, and um, there was a yeah. was that a picture of some little boy at the beach or something? God, I can't remember now. It was it was um, the once more one. It's just a monochrome one. It's it's a, I think it's a rose, and it's just black and white, and it just says the wedding present once more yeah. on it. Yes, God damn, was that a sellout gig? Um, this was not this. Now, this story, this this story has now been immortalised. David David Gedge from the wedding present, so they're still going, has just um, released his his second volume of his autobiography, which I don't know if you're aware or not. But it's yeah, in, I saw that. It's just these are happening. Comic comic book form. So they tell stories from the history of the band, and this gig is immortalised in that book, which is probably the. the Proudest moments of my my career, well, yes, my absolutely. Life. Um, but it was it, it, the the gig itself was absolutely brilliant. We the, the band. I'll I'll keep this short because it's quite a long story, but it's worth telling. Uh, when the band turned up, the whole place was locked up. The caretaker hadn't arrived, um, so we were just sitting around on the car park for ages. And then somebody produced a football, so there was this this game of football on the car park. <laughs> Um, and then eventually the, the, the guy turned up with the key, let us in. We set all the gear up, they sound checked. Um, now, I can't remember. I think we had a local support band. So the, the support band were on. And the gig was fantastic. It was really good. The, the crowd absolutely loved it. The band really enjoyed playing it. You know, whenever I speak to David, um, these days, you know, and he always remembers it, which is obviously why he wanted to put it in his book. Um, but it became apparent during the course of the night that we were going to fall quite a long way short of the the fee. We couldn't afford to pay the band. I think mean, that the two hundred and fifty pounds. I think it was they wanted. Yes, uh, we were quite a long way short of that, having paid for the hire of the venue and the PA, which I think we we spent a little bit more on because it was the wedding present <laughs> um so we, we had a bit of an emergency meeting in the in the back room and one of the girls who was involved in in our little um group she just said well, I'll, I'll just go around and tell people so she she literally went around with a, a little plastic bag just saying look we can't afford to pay the band could you possibly contribute a couple of quid in order to help pay the fees and you know people, by and large people were happily just dropping Excellent. money into this bag so even even in the room next door where the, the, the club regulars were playing dominoes you know I think a couple of them even chucked a little bit in nice and we, we were still we were still short at the end of the night so rather sheepishly I had to approach the band and say look you know 
have you enjoyed yourselves? Oh, yes, it was wonderful. Oh, that's, that's good to hear because we can't afford to pay. You. <laughs> so we, we kind of explained the situation and, and they were very, very good about it. And they just said, oh, look, don't worry. We'll just take 200. And I think they had something like 220. He said, you know, just buy yourselves a drink with the other 20 quid or whatever. Oh, that's so, so sweet it all, it of all them. Worked. It was. It was It was brilliant. Something I've never forgotten. No, um, my God, that is such um, a nice story. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you know, we, we fell quite a long way short that night, but it, yeah, it ultimately didn't matter. I think no. it was just... But how did you, you know, pick yourselves up as, as kind of potential promoters after that kind of hiccup after you, for your second um, gig? Well, we, we, I don't, I mean, I don't think it bothered us to be, you know, we, we were quite, quite confident in ourselves and, you know, Oh, this you know we, we're getting getting a bit of reputation now we've, we've got coverage in the local press and you know bands were starting to contact us yes. which was you know i mean obviously a sign that we were doing something right um obviously we weren't advertising the fact we couldn't always afford to pay them no. but, uh, you know so bands were getting in touch and i think the the chesterfields was was possibly the next one a few weeks later and I think they must have contacted us. I have no recollection of, of, of us trying to get hold of them. Somehow they must have heard and just... Oh my God. Up. So that's Simon Barber and gang who are, who, are still, yeah. who are still releasing new material, which is just... They amazing. are, yeah. So yeah. They've got a new, new album out, so that's all very good. Uh, yeah, so you really were part of that whole jingly jangly indie scene, weren't you? So, um, yes, yeah, all the I mean, classics... Yeah, I mean, we had Mighty Mighty as well, uh, the Sea Urchins. Um, and then I think the, it must have been the following year, this, this was a quite, there was quite a big gap. Um, we had the Rose Hips and the Flatmates on. Um, and also, that, how, like, I apologise here because my memory is a little bit hazy, but certainly at one of these gigs, and I can't remember which one it was. It, I, I've got a feeling it was the Rose Hips, Flatmates one. We had a third band on who went on to become the Telescopes. Right. My uh, God, they, that was um, brilliant. Sensitive, sensitive, yeah, Sensitive Children, they were called at the time. The Telescopes, and, you know, wow. A few so months how... later, they'd become the Telescopes. And... At that stage, because often doing these things, you just kind of break in even. Did it ever feel quite like hard work? Did you ever sort of think, God, you know, is this is this kind of worth it? I just wondered how your narrative went on on sort of organising these things because because you think, oh, we could make lots of money. Then you realise the only people who are doing really well are the person the person who's running the bar mostly, isn't it? Because they yeah they're selling lots of drink and everyone's kind of sweating and thinking, God, all that responsibility and all that kind of admin and phone calls and anticipation and also the caretaker i'd forgot about the caretaker and the key and whether they were going to turn up after their tea once they you know had had sort of sat down at 5 30 on the dock because they're quite awkward aren't they to caretakers yeah yeah they do have a moment no, was... <laughs> we were just relieved he came we didn't have we didn't have any contingency plans no an out, absolutely out, an outdoor gig an outdoor gig just somehow stealing or just playing or just playing for so did you see the wedding present film george best when it came out a few I years have, yeah yeah i have seen it such yes. a beautiful story so look 87 yeah. which i still think is one of the great years of music because the releases that year were just amazing though 86 is also good so were you just still were you working at this stage or were you at college um i was working we in fact we were kind of mixed some some of the group were at college some of us were working um so yeah this you know this was obviously in addition to what we were doing in our our day-to-day -day lives but going back to what you your question we never considered it hard work at all it, it was it was something we wanted to do we enjoyed every single minute of it you know, just producing the posters, um, going around fly posting, sticking them in copies of the enemy and sounds and the local WH Smiths and, um, you know, ringing up the radio stations and the local press. And right. OK. They were, you know, getting getting the, in the gig listings in sounds of the enemy. It was it was wonderful. It really was such a, a great time. 
Yes, yeah, because when because kind of eighty seven was a bit of a watershed because then the Smiths break up and that that kind of period of all those a lot of those bands who'd been going for five years were all getting a bit tired. They'd done one or two albums, and also there was a bit of a lack of money. And also then what I've noticed is you get that next wave of sixteen to eighteen year olds that come along, and they want a different soundtrack. And then you had the dance world of, you know, I suppose a lot of. A few indie bands made that jump, but there was definitely a bit of a dance scene. And then Ecstasy comes along, which changes the sort of the drug of choice, doesn't it, in some ways. So what was your period of 87, 88 like? Um, well, 80, like I said, we, we put the, the Rose Hips gig on in the summer, I think, in 87. And then I I moved away. Um, I moved back up. I'm originally from the northwest of England, and I moved back up to up to Cumbria um for a few years so I, it, it all kind of stopped i think it it, it just run its natural course really yes we'd, you know we would put on these gigs we'd had a great time doing it and like you say a lot a lot of the bands that that we liked had either become too big for us to put on you know even within that that six 12 month period you know bands like the wedding present we, we just could as great as they were and as as understanding as they were you know it comes to a point where it becomes a it, it's it's a living for them, so you you have to pay the full fee. They're yes. not going to waver, on, you know. And, and it, you know the LP was out, and they were playing much bigger venues, and we, we you know we just couldn't compete. Um, so it was. I think it it just ran its course. Really, there, there was no. We didn't sort of sit down and, and discuss like, is this the end? Where do no. we go from here? Do we, do we start? I think I think on? the, the I, thing I like, with those gigs is that the, the margins are so incredibly small, aren't they? You know, you think, oh, we've made five pounds. This is amazing. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it was it was never about that. It was it was just about putting on bands that we liked and hoping that other people would come along and, and enjoy themselves too. And that happened. So in in that respect, it was a, a huge success. And yes. I, I look back on it with with very, very fond memories. Have you managed to keep the flyers or the posters that you produced? I do. I, I do. I've, I've kept everything. I'm, I'm, <laughs> That's fantastic. Quite sad in that respect. So no. Sadly, well, I, I, I can't... I was going to I say that it's kind of strange in the in in this in the way that um, when that scene happened and it was like oh that was brilliant and then you get on with the rest of your life it's kind of I find it kind of interesting because suddenly you you've got all these compilations and books that are coming out from that period haven't you so um, you know Cherry Red Records was obviously bringing out sort of they started at I suppose eighty six didn't they and then they went to ninety one and now they're going back to eighty five and might be going back to eighty one I guess so and then everyone's writing their little memoirs about that period and that time so it's been quite sweet really so um, it was it was quite a nice little gig a nice little sort of scene at that stage which I think when it when it finished it just all seemed to be sort of thrown in the recycling and that was like yeah that's fine but I don't know people have gone back and sort of looked at it again and. Um, some of it is just better than I remember, bizarrely. So that's that's been quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was. I mean, it, it was good. We we were all sort of the right age. You know, you, you kind of get to twenty two, twenty three, um, and it yeah, and and everyone. I, I think everyone was was really friendly as well. That that was the you know the the main thing that I took from it was how supportive everybody was of, of each other. You know, we we kind of you know we'd always go and speak to bands at gigs and speak, you know people I'd met at gigs, people just in the crowd. You know, you'd chat away, and you know some of them are still friends now. You know, and it was that was something about that that I hesitate to use the phrase, but scene that yes. was very positive, very positive. You know, there's and I think that's why people now are looking back on it with with such fond memories. You know, because it, it was a good time. It was so sweet. It was very good. So, yeah. did you did you the rest of your life? Did you did you sort of go off and do probably other things and just just music was one of your sort of part time passions? Um, well, a, a, a few years a few years after all this, I'm, I moved back down to to the Midlands, <laughs> um, and I had a, a, a sort of a modicum of success with a band of my own. Um, we we put out a few singles. We were got a John Peel session, which was probably the the highlight of my musical life. Well, that's um, fantastic. Not, what was your band called? They, uh, we were called American TV Cops. 
Um, you can't... We, we, were, we were based in, in Leachfield in Staffordshire. And so the, the fir, our first single, in fact, our first demo tape, Steve Lamack played it on his show, the demo tape. Um, and then when we released the song as a single, he made it single of the week. Um, we had quite a few big support slots. Um, kind of Shed Seven, we supported, and Smash, These Animal Men, um, Bush, we played with Bush, which is a whole podcast in itself, I think, that night. Yes. Um, so yeah, we we you know we were we were reasonably successful. The, the the three singles that we put out were well received, got lots of airplay on on John Peel, Steve Lamack, one or two sort of independent radio programs. So did well. you what label did you get signed to? Well we weren't signed. We we put everything out ourselves. Um which is again is something I'm, I'm very proud of. You know, people talk about indies and indie labels, and a lot of them have, do have quite a bit of backing behind them. Um, but this was this was us, you know, we, we were all working, the four of us in the band were all working at the time. So we were self-financing. Uh, we put these records out, we, you know, off our own back. And really pleased. I mean, a couple of them char- charted, uh, got in the, the indie charts in the NNA. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and and I think we subsequently found out much much later that we you know we we caused a bit of a stir in in the music industry obviously because you know people like Peel and and Steve Lamack were were playing our records and we were getting some quite high profile gigs in London um, and we couldn't understand why nobody was waving a, a fat check under our nose yes and we only found out a few years later that everybody just assumed that we were signed. So <laughs> nobody made an approach, which was <laughs> quite frustrating, really. Uh, but oh, again, it, you know, it 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 was it was fun. You know, we. Uh, I think I was quite a bit older than the rest of the guys in the band. Um, so for me, it was kind of like my my last shot, if you like. Uh, and I was just determined to enjoy it. Things things like me- recording the session for John Peel was all I ever wanted to do since being thirteen years old. So you met so the famous fun. Dale Griffith, didn't you? Um, was he? I can't, now, this is something I'm, I'm, I'm eternally embarrassed about, is that I can't remember who the engineers were. Who your engineer was on the John yeah. Peel? We had oh. two. There was, a, the, there was a, a, a man and a lady. The lady actually came from Stoke-on-Trent. So we had quite a bit of local sort of interesting in common. We were talking sort of about Staffordshire. At yes. Rent. But I, I, I'm so ashamed to say I can't remember their names. Isn't that terrible? But they so were you... very good to us. They were they they were great. You know, it was I think just the whole experience of recording that session was was so good because they just basically let you go in and play live. They record a live version, and then if there's time to put on a couple of overdubs, which we did, that was hand claps and backing vocals. I think we didn't overdub any guitars. Yes. They let you do that, and it, it's very much a live performance. And so, which in a lot of ways is is why many many session versions are better than the the singles that come out. Yes, well, Hatful of Hollow was definitely better than yeah. the first record, wasn't it? But yeah, so this is the mid nineties that you got all this kind of this exciting release, which was more is it new wave for the new wave or no? I can't remember what it was called, but Smash was part of that scene, wasn't it? Yeah. We kind of got lumped into that. I mean, we we didn't really. I think because we because of where we were, even though we were playing in London a lot, and that was a that was a conscious choice. We kind of decided right from day one. Really, we 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 weren't going to just hang around playing local gigs. We we kind of wanted to get down and get ourselves seen and heard, and and yes. I think. I think it was just quite easy for people to lump us in. You know, oh, you sound a little bit like... I mean, we, we did have a very very buzzcock sound, <laughs> which is probably my influence. Yes. Um, so I think we probably did get kind of lumped in with, with that, which wasn't a bad thing. It helped us get gigs. You know, like I said, we, we played with, with Smash a couple of times and these animal men. But then the flip side of that, we were playing with bands like Shed Seven. 
you know, who were who were very different. So you did four tracks for John Peel. Were these the only time you the only recordings of the band? Um, well, the, the the first was our first single, so that that had already been released, um, and. Then I think Cruiser was on the session and we released that was our third single. So there are, there are proper recorded, proper. There are um, records of, of Thirst and Cruiser. Excellent. And Sandwich in the Middle was, was Atrocity Girl. Yeah. Yes, and you did. I know because I saw, I was just looking at the John Peel kind of, I don't know, fan page. And so you got played quite a lot on his show and also the British Forces Broadcasting Service as well and the World Service, which is exciting. So this is all the, yeah, so you were on your own label, which was called Pest Records. That's, yeah, that's correct. That's it. My God. So then 95, the, the height of Britpop, the John Major years. What, did you, <laughs> so how did the band finish? Um, we kind of, it got to a stage where, um, like I said, because we were all working and there were, there were times when we'd have, there'd be a gig in London. So you'd finish work at 3.30 or whatever on the Wednesday, you'd drive all the way down to London, you'd set up, you'd sound check, you'd play the gig, you'd have a drink afterwards, you'd pack everything away, come back, you'd crawl into bed at sort of four in the morning and then you, you were up at seven to go to work again and it, it yes. gets quite tiring obviously and even though we'd, we'd kind of achieved um a little bit of success t- t- for that next step it needed us to all sort of pitch in and say right we're going to do this full time i think and we we couldn't really make that sacrifice i i was in a situation that then when i couldn't really say you know if i'd have been 10 years younger I'd, I'd, I'd have definitely taken the risk without yes. a doubt but I was I was 33 34 or whatever and I, it was like you know I, I can't really I'm enjoying what we're doing I can't really gamble on the band yes um, so uh, there was a bit of a quiet period where we, we didn't really sort of split up and then the others decided to carry on they got in another guitarist and they they recorded an LP that didn't get released. Um, they they did a few gigs, but again, I think it was just a case of you know you, to make that next step. And unless you get a break, unless somebody comes along and says, "Right, you're exactly what we've been looking for. Here's X amount of pounds to record an LP, go on a tour, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera, it, it's very very difficult. Yes. Um, and, they, and in the end, they just kind of faded away, which was it's a real shame. You know, I think that they put out a couple of couple of singles after after I left. There was a, one on a compilation EP, and then a, a single of their own. Yeah, um, the LP didn't get released, unfortunately. Um, so, have you put up the music on some Bandcamp page? Is that available now? Um, all that's available, to my knowledge, is the John Peel session is on YouTube. Um, I think if you just type in American TV, oh, culture, excellent, it comes up. Um, but the the rest of the stuff, no, I, uh, no, I, I haven't done anything with it. I suppose I should really. I mean, I think I think the tapes are still around somewhere. The masters, um, excellent. Yes, it's a great probably project. Get, probably get probably get somebody to remix it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Well, oh, that's always quite nice. I know there's another guy called Precious Recordings of London who started up about a year ago or two, and he's been putting out John Peel and Janice Long sessions from the late 80s and early 90s, which have been quite beautifully put, produced and packaged, and, um, yes, good vinyl and digital downloads and stuff. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. There's a slight excitement about, um, yes, archiving. Everyone loves archiving at the moment, don't they? So that's all good. Yeah. So then after that band, was it was that your musical moment, you know, with the gigs and the and the band? Was that it? That was it, yeah. That was it. I I, I emigrated very soon after that. Um and then I was in Thailand for nearly twenty five years. Um which is where I'm I'm actually there at the moment. I'm here at the here at the moment, here at the moment. Excellent. Uh, but I'm 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 based more or less in the in back in England now, but I do come out here a couple of times a year. I've still got my house here and family here. Um so yeah, I was I was 
moved over here and, and so the, the final kind of phase I guess involved the wedding present again and a few years ago they they came to play in Hong Kong and I wasn't able to go it was during the week and even though Hong Kong is only a, a few hours from here um, because I was working I couldn't get away and I could, so it was, it was just impossible but we I made a pact with a friend I said if, if if they come back to Hong Kong again, we'll definitely go. We'll pull out all the stops. And yes. sure enough, um, I think it was, was it 2018, 2018, I think they, they they announced that they were coming to Hong Kong and it was a weekend. So I thought, right, brilliant, we're going. So I, I ordered the tickets online and started looking at flights. And then I got a message from my, from my friend and he said, I'm really sorry, but I can't go. Uh, I have to work. Something's come up. I have to work, and I was—I was—I was, I can't repeat what I said yes. on here, but I wasn't very happy. And um, and he—he he just kind of said as a like a flippant gesture, he said, "Oh, don't worry." He said, "Why don't you get him to come and play in Bangkok?" And I sort of hung up the phone, and I just thought, "Do you know what? I'm going to show him, and I'm going to do just that." So um, I emailed someone who I knew was still in touch with David Gedge, and I just said, "If if you next time you speak with David." And you ask him to drop me a line if he fancies bringing the wedding present to Bangkok. And within a couple of days, I got an email from David Gedge saying, we're very interested. Um, can you let us know more? So I'm thinking, right, this is serious. Yes. Um, so that kind of set the ball rolling. Um, we, we managed to find a venue. Um, we priced everything up. Now, bearing in mind that we'd we'd let them down before, David was quite insistent that I paid up front this time, <laughs> and it was and it was a lot more than than two hundred pounds. I think. Yeah. So we, we, had, we had to pay for like the, the flight. I think the, the, the gig before here was where had they been before here? It could even have been Hong Kong, and this was going to be the last gig on the on the tour. So we had to pay for their incoming flights. We obviously had to pay the fee. We had to pay for the hotels or, you know, all this kind of stuff. We had to pay up front. So I managed to scrape the money together and we were like, we did all the sums and we thought, right, okay, we need 150 people to make this break even, charging a thousand baht, which is yeah. about 25 quid, I think, probably still. Um, which, which isn't bad. I mean, Jack Jack White played here last weekend, and it was I think the cheapest tickets were four and a half thousand. So that gives you some idea of of how cheap we were doing it. Um, so we, you know, we had a few hiccups along the way, but eventually, you know, everything was confirmed. The band turned up. Uh, we got a local band supporting. We've been selling tickets to a, an online ticket company. Uh, ticket sales were going steadily rather than spectacularly I think it's fair to say <laughs> uh, and then on the night we had a few people turn up um, and we just broke even we, we, we 150 people turned up and it was uh, incredible you know we'd done all the sums and we were looking at it and it was like zero zero and that was it wow the band, oh. the band had a great time. In, in spite of the, um, we had a bit of a technical problem after the first song. One of the amps had overheated. Apparently, there was an old valve amp that we had got on loan from the support band that they'd been using in their set. And by the time the wedding present came to play, it was quite hot and it just cut out. So there was a bit of a five-minute delay while we scurried around and replaced the amp. But it all went really smooth. Everybody had a great time. The band loved it. Um, then they went off on holiday and left all the equipment in my spare room. So it was <laughs> God, that's such a nice story. So, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. There you so, go. There you go. God, the pressures of being a a promoter. It's quite hard yeah. work, isn't it? In, internationally as well. And then and then they actually came again the following year. I, just, I, I got a call out of the blue from David saying they'd been offered a, a festival in somewhere really obscure. I won't say Nepal. It, it was somewhere that you would not expect to have the, to have a rock fest, with all due respect to the, the country involved. Yes. And he just said to make, to make it worth their while, they were trying to get three or four other dates in the, in the region. 
um, would we be interested in putting them on again? So I said, yeah, of course. So we went through the whole process again and again just broke even. So it was... <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, a, you know, 150 people. That's, you know, it's like yeah. you think there must be 150 people who'd be just curious to go and see the wedding well, present. That's, yeah, that's what we figured. We, you know, we, we were realistic. We thought, well, you know, the, it's not like we're getting Springsteen or Madonna or whatever. No. It's, you know, it's, it's the wedding present. You know, I think with those gigs, book. those indie gigs in the 80s and probably the 90s, I think it was like people were looking at getting 100 to 150. It was that kind of benchmark, wasn't it? Yeah, Paying yeah. Quite a lot, a lot less money. So, but yeah, the margins were so tight. Well, that's amazing. This is fantastic. Well, look, thank you, Dal. Um, I'm, I'm gonna have to go in a bit actually because it's nearly quarter to two. But um, but yes, yeah, well, no, thank you welcome. for your time. This has been amazing. I'm so pleased. I didn't. You probably mentioned about being in the band, but I hadn't realised that. I forgot. And your wedding present stories, which is just great. So does that mean then that, like me, you're you're kind of consuming all these books that people have written from the 80s and 90s that's that have just been published? From yes, from me- I have. I'm- I'm I'm, do, I'm doing my best to catch up. Like I, I think I said earlier, I've, I've got quite a backlog. Um, I've I've just I'm slightly off topic, but I've just read Stephen Morris's first volume of his autobiography, and I've got uh, Mickey Berenice's line oh, up to go next. So that's a classic, isn't it? Yes, that's a good one. Yeah. Really. So um, yeah, yes. well, I, I I've met Mickey a few times, and she was always great company really nice to talk to really yeah. funny really friendly so I'm, I'm looking forward to reading the other book that i found really engaging was the james brown one animal house because um uh, so there yeah you go. i haven't i haven't read that yeah that's on my list so I'd say it, it's funny because they just seem to be coming out at, a, at such a rate these days that you, it's hard to keep up i mean the, the, there's the hungry beat book about the early 80s scottish scene yes waiting to read i've just read bobby gillespie's autobiography david gedge's new books out as well you know it's so yeah it's there's there's, there's just too much not enough time not there's enough not time. enough time but look look dale thank you ever so much for this this has been amazing and i'll tell you when i put it out and um yes keep no, in that's touch. great thank, thank you like i say you know it's it's just a little snippet of of what was going on yes the indie pop yeah i've often wanted to get this yeah. guy barry who barry newman who used to do these ones at norwich the wild club but he's i don't know he's he's not that keen and i think he's had some yeah. stuff that's happened so he doesn't talk about stuff like that anymore which is a bit of a shame but um yeah. but luckily during lockdown everyone went in their attics got their kind of memorabilia and started putting it on facebook so that yeah. was quite well, nice. I'm, I'm i'm going to do that and like i said I, I don't have it with me here it's all it's all back in england but i, I do i kept everything so there's there's probably quite a few little uh treasures in there that are God, yes do yes it's got to be archived we <laughs> love those archiving moments and i'll try and remember where i put those other books actually you were talking about from the london scene but um yes anyway anyway look thanks a lot i'm better hit the right. Uh, thank you david really enjoyed Take care. That. Thank cheers you. Have, thank have you bye-bye bye-bye bye bye and that was me in conversation with dale farrington to find out more about life in indie pop land during the 80s and also quite re- recently with the wedding present um indeed this has been the c86 show i'm david Eastor. i was just realizing this was 6 30 in the morning i know i'm so keen anyway a massive thank you again to dale for giving me the time for that and to um yes hear his story it's all so important anyway look if you want to contact me you can on facebook twitter instagram just do c86 show All these have been archived. Yes, indeed. You can find those on Spotify, iTunes, Podbeam. It's true. Anyway, keep it positive and groovy. And, um, yes, have a great week and stay safe.